Good evening. How is everybody doing tonight? <clears throat> hey, Pam. <clears throat> I'm just going to wait a minute. <laughs> So we're going to cover a pretty meaty, meaty um, topic tonight. <laughs> Hi, Shane. Hi, Lori. Yeah, so tonight um, we are going to be talking about essential oils of the Bible. And I cannot wait. <clears throat> this, is, um, this is actually has become one of my favorite um, classes and um, because it's just so rich in meaning and it goes way beyond just how do we use the oils to make our house smell nice or how do we use the oils in our cleaning? Um, how do we use the oils for our health? There is so much more to essential oils um, and it comes from, um, yeah, it comes from not just, it's not a fad. Let's just say that. It's been around for quite a while. <laughs> uh, so I'm really excited about tonight. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and get started because there's a lot, a lot that I want to cover. Um, <clears throat> let me just get my oils out. <laughs> and this beautiful oh I gotta take out the look at how beautiful these oils are isn't that cool alright so I just want to thank you all for taking the time even if you're not watching this live you probably are I know a lot of people are going to be catching the replay which is another reason why I want to go ahead and get started <laughs> um, so I just want to thank you for joining me um, I am so excited to share this because I do think that it is one of the most meaningful the most meaningful teaching about essential oils and tonight I'm going to be giving away some oily gifts so, but you have to be able to answer some questions to be entered into a drawing to receive these oily gifts. Um, so I'm going to be giving away a bottle of Cypress tonight because I'm going to be ask, asking three questions. Hey, Carol. Um, I'm going to be asking three questions and to be entered in the drawing, you only need to answer one correctly. You don't have to answer all three. Um, so just as long as you answer at least one and put it in the comments, put your answer in the comments. So there's three questions. Okay. And then at the end, I will announce the winner and it may take me a while. I might not be able to, I actually, I might not be able to announce it live. I might have to do it <laughs> in the comments. Um, but I'm giving away a bottle of Cypress and I'm giving away two roller bottles of the holy anointing oil which we're going to talk about tonight so i'm giving away three oily gifts who would like to receive an oily gift tonight for me who would like to receive a bottle of cypress or who would like to receive a, a roller bottle of the holy anointing oil <laughs> so in order to be entered you need to be able to answer at least one of these three questions okay so you might want to write these questions down because I'm going to touch on these as I go through and teach tonight. So the first question, the first question is, I might have to repeat, I might have to repeat these throughout because I know some people are coming on later. But question number one is, name one oil listed in the holy anointing oil. So name one oil listed in the holy anointing oil. Okay, um, the question number two is, what is the first oil to be mentioned in Genesis and the last in Revelation? 
So what is the first oil to be mentioned in Genesis and the last in, in Revelation? And then question number three is, which oil is referred to as the oil of gladness? So which oil is referred to as the oil of gladness? So those are the three questions that, um, that if you can answer them, um, put them in comment. Um, and then you might even, like, as I say it, you might even want to put it in the comments or whatever. But um, if more than one person obviously answers, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to do a drawing. <laughs> so, but to be entered in the drawing, you have to answer a question. All right. So name one of the oils listed in the holy anointing oil. What is the first oil to be mentioned in Genesis and the last in Revelation? And which oil is referred to as the oil of gladness? So those are the three questions. Okay. All right, so, but real quick, before we dive in, um, for those of you who don't know my story, um, my essential oil journey began in 2009 when my daughter's preschool teacher introduced me to Young Living via the Thieves Household Cleaner. And prior to that, um, I had absolutely no clue about essential oils. I didn't know really much about toxin-free living. Um, I was addicted to bleach, Lysol, Comet, soft scrub, like anything that said antibacterial, I bought it. So yeah, couldn't be further from natural <laughs> toxin-free living. Um, hippies and tree huggers are like the extent of what I thought about essential oils. And I didn't realize that essential oils were for more than just fragrance. In fact, if I'm being completely honest, when I first got started, I didn't even like many the, the smell of many of the oils. Like I, I was like, oh, <laughs> you know. Um, so being the nerdy skeptic that I am, I say that loud and proud, and I am a nerdy skeptic. Um, I had to know the whys and hows of essential oils, and I needed to know that there was like legit science to back up everything that people were saying about these oils, right? This plant juice. So not only did I learn that there is chemistry, there's biology, and there's real science behind them, I began experiencing tremendous personal benefit um, because for years, um, I had struggled with upper respiratory issues, I struggled with women's issues, and I was just trying all sorts of stuff, stuff and nothing seemed to help. And I just started to think like, well, this is just the way I am, and I guess I'm just going to have to learn to live with it. And so essential oils actually caught me off guard because I was very, very leery of them. And it just wasn't one of those things that I thought would work. So when I no longer needed my inhaler, when I no longer needed my nose spray, my allergy meds, my decongestants, my cough drops, and my pain relievers, I was like, what? <laughs> and even my, my woman doctor um, had thrown her hands up at me and she just su suggested, she was just like, well, just have a hysterectomy because she didn't have any answers for the troubles that I was having that really debilitated me every single month. So, and my husband will tell you that he's very, very glad that we found the oils and he insists that I order my hormone supporting oils every single month, regard whatever the cost. Like he's like, I don't care how much it costs, you need those oils. So even he will tell you that they, you know, that they work. So, um, so maybe you're like how I was, you know, maybe you're skeptical or you're leery of, you know, this plant juice, these essential oils, and I totally get you. I get you. I get you. I know exactly how you feel. But I just want to tell you that for us, this is not a fad. It is not voodoo. It's not a placebo effect. Um, at the time of this, at the time of this live, December 2019, we have been living this lifestyle for over 10 years. So for me and my family, it is a way of life. It's not a hobby for us. It's not a fun little side thing that we do. Um, I no longer know what it is like to not use and rely heavily on my essential oils every single day. This is my business. Um, it is my job, so to speak, because I know that these oils, I know what these oils have done for me and I know what others um, have experienced and the benefits that they have received um, from using the oils. And I know that their lives have been transformed by them. So it's not just me, like over the last 10 years, 10 plus years, I, have, I can tell you there's like so many testimonials and stories that I could go on and on and on and on for days telling you about what has um, uh, 
uh, how the oils have affected people. So when I talk, when I teach, and when I post on social media about essential oils, just know that it comes from a very genuine concern for others. I'm not, I'm not selling um, anything. I am. I, I really feel strongly about educating and helping others. So it does come from a very genuine, sincere place um, because I know that people are struggling. And I because I talk to people, I hear people when I'm out and about, I, I mean, strangers will tell you what their struggles are health-wise, you know? Like there um, is no shortage of people who have, um, ha um, you know, who don't have health issues. Um, and I know that there are natural things that can help. Um, and over the last 10 years, I have heard countless stories of just about how people were one way, have whatever issue that they were struggling with, and then when they started adopting a healthier, natural lifestyle and implementing the essential oils, implementing healthier lifestyle habits, getting the toxins out of their home, and, um, you know, just, you know, living that more natural lifestyle, um, it, it transformed their lives. So, and I just love being a part of that story that those people, um, in my life, there's people in my life who, and who are on, um, who are in the granola babes community, um, that I'm a part of. I mean, like, it's so cool to be a part of that family with such rich, um, stories about how they've changed their lives. So anyway, Tonight, we are talking about essential oils of the Bible, and I just thought it did it, that during this Christmas season, it would be really appropriate to talk about this, right? Um, another thing that got me over the hurdle of skepticism with the oils was the biblical aspect of them. And I realized that, well, you know, essential oils come from plants, which God created. So essential oils are you know, they're the extracted plant blood or plant juice that comes from the roots, from the stems, from the leaves, from the petals, the bark, and the resins of flowers and herbs and rinds and trees and fruit. And I know that God created everything, everything for a purpose. Um, in Genesis 112, it says the land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds, and God saw that it was good, right? So if God says that plants are good, <laughs> then I know that plants are good. So in Genesis 129, it says, then God said, I give you um, every seed bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it, they will be yours for food, right? So God created and gave us plants for nourishment, for our good to sustain life. Um, we all know how important it is for us to eat lots of fruits and veggies, right? Because they contain vitamins, they contain vital nutrients and minerals and antioxidants. There are so many beneficial ingredients for the health of our body and our mind. So knowing this also helped me to see that maybe essential oils aren't just irre irrelevant, frivolous things, right? So, but what I'm going to share with you tonight takes it like 20 steps further, right? We, when we take a deeper look into how and why oils are mentioned in scripture, we're going to see that there is deep meaning and significance in them. And my prayer is that um, what I share with you tonight will not point to how amazing oils are, but just how incredible our God is. And because we are not called to worship um, and praise the gift, right? The gift of essential oils, which I think, that's how I think of oils. That's how I think of plants and all the things that God created for us. I think of them as, as gifts, but we're not supposed to worship and praise the gift. We're supposed to worship and praise the giver, right? It's supposed to point to God. So upon further research and study into this topic, I was just completely humbled and in awe of how God worked even plants and essential oils into his redemptive story. In fact, the first time that I went through this class, like I cried. <laughs> I cried. And then when I had to teach it again, I was like, I was doing everything I could not to cry because there are certain parts that I'm just like, 
whoa, like this is so stinking cool how God thought about all of this and just the, the significance and the meaning behind it. So the ways we use oils today are we can use them topically or aromatically or internally. So what that means is we can apply them to our skin, we can inhale the aroma, and we can even ingest Young Living Vitality oils. You cannot ingest any other oils. Don't go to a store and buy oils and think that you can ingest them. Young Living Essential Oils, um, they are the only company um, that has a designa designated grass certified by the FDA um, oils safe for ingestion, okay? In fact, most oils that you will find in the store or online say for external use only, do not take internally. Um, and there is a reason. It's because they're filled with a bunch of other stuff and they're not good quality oils. So you don't want to be putting that in your body or on your skin or inhale them into your lungs. Just saying. <laughs> and that's, I digress. But um, oils are extracted through steam distillation and cold pressing. And steam distillation was used by the Babylonians, the Chinese, the East Indians, Egyptians, and Sumerians as far back as 3500 BC. And they relied on oils for baths, for healing, for perfumes, and for anointing. So oil is specifically mentioned um, uh, 191 times in the Bible, but there are over 600 references to essential oils and or the 33 species of plants they come from. And essential oils are referred to as fragrances, odors, ointments, aromas, <clears throat> excuse me, perfumes, or sweet savors. So the Greek language has more specific words for things um, where we might have just one, okay? So for example, we have one word for love, okay? Whereas in the Bible, there is eros, phileia, agape. Um, those, are, those are very specific Greek words that, um, uh, that define or identify a specific, more, more specific kind of love, whereas we just have love, right? Like, I love my dog, I love my cat, I love my house, I love my husband. <laughs> so we have one word for love, whereas they have, in the Greek language, you know, they have, um, you know, a very special love that you would identify with your spouse or a love that God has or, you know, so which is more specific. So the original Greek, had three root words which have all been translated into the English word heal, okay? So three, um, there is sozo, which is used over 100 times. And this is mentioned when referring to God rescuing believers from the penalty and power of sin and into his provisions. And we see this in John 3, 16 through 17, you know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever shall believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save or sozo the world through him. Okay, so that's one word, Greek word sozo for heal, what we would say heal. Now then we have the Greek word um, leomai, and I'm not a Greek scholar or anything, so I don't know if I'm pronouncing these right, but I'm just going to go with it. Um, and this is mentioned 27 times in scripture, and this refers almost exclusively uh, to the supernatural healing that Jesus performed to bring attention to himself as the great and ultimate physician, right? So 27 times in scripture, um, the word um, leomai, and that is another word for um, heal, what we would say, what we would say heal. Then we have the Greek word therapeo, and this is the third kind of healing, and this word is mentioned over 40 times in scripture, and it means reversing a physical condition to restore a person having an illness or disease, and it is the root word of therapy, and typically involves natural elements in the process of healing, okay? So, for example, in Mark 6.13, where Jesus instructs his disciples to anoint the sick with oil and heal them, the healing word used there is therapeo. And in Revelation 22.2, um, where it says, the leaves of the trees shall be for the healing of the nations, the word again is therapeo. 
And so God does not ask um, that we do miracles. He only asks that we care for the sick and help them find healing by applying his natural um, medicines um, and to pray. He calls us to pray, right? And to lay hands on people to pray for them and anoint them with oil. So God is the only one who provides the healing, whether over time or instantly. Um, he works both ways, um, but healing ultimately comes from him. Okay, so in Exodus, it talks about a holy anointing oil. And in Exodus 30, we see the Israelites involved in a massive caravan, which estimates about 2.4 million people. Can you imagine a caravan of 2.4 million people going through the wilderness, right? And as they left Egypt, this is when they left Egypt and they're wandering around the, in the desert on their way to the Holy Land um, because of their disobedience. It took them 40 years to, to do this when it really should not have taken them that long. But, you know, <laughs> so God was very specific in the way he instructed the Israelites to make this holy anointing oil, which is what I'm going to be giving away tonight. It's not the same exact holy anointing oil, obviously, but it's similar. There's, I'm going to be using um, the, the same oil, a lot of the same oils that are, are mentioned. So in their purpose, um, the holy anointing oil, okay, he, God gave and instructed the Israelites on how to make it and how to, and, uh, and the purpose and the meaning behind it, okay? So this holy anointing oil um, was a blend of myrrh, cinnamon, balsam fir, and cassia, okay? So that's myrrh, cinnamon, balsam fir, and cassia. And this anointing oil was used on the tent of meeting, the ark of um, testimony, the table and utensils, the altar of incense, the altar of burnt offerings, and on Aaron and his sons, the priests. So day after day, Hour after hour, the priests were performing sacrifices and shedding blood to cover the sins of their people. So you can imagine, like, put yourself in, in that place and time, right? Like, imagine these animals being sacrificed and the blood, I mean, the blood and the smell and probably the bacteria with all of the sacrifices in the temple, right? And the Lord commanded them to cover every surface and person in this temple with this anointing oil blend. So this was used to bless and it was used to cleanse the offerings brought into the tent of meeting and later into the temple in itself. So the Young Living Oil Blend Exodus 2 so Exodus 2, um, this, um, this contains, it's not an exact replica of the holy anointing oil. I love the smell of this oil. But it does contain myrrh and cassia and cinnamon, calamus, black spruce, hyssop, vetiver, and frankincense. So this, um, this Exodus 2 blend con um, contains those. And it has very... Um, is similar, many of the similar oils that are found in the holy anointing oil. And this is an oil blend that I love to use for anointing a person during prayer or anointing a room, like before Bible study, like we anoint the room. <laughs> you can anoint your home. You can diffuse it in your home during the fall and winter months. Um, it just really supports the body and it supports um, and cleanses the air. Okay. And I just, like I said, I just love the smell of it. Like when I smell, um, um, yes, I am Lori. I'm going to talk more about cassia and hyssop. Absolutely. Especially hyssop. Oh! Okay. So anyway, but I, when I smell this oil, um, I smell, uh, cinnamon and, um, I just, I love the smell of it. it smells fantastic. Okay. So let's talk about anointing. So to anoint someone is to cover them with an ointment, right? It means to cover. It means to rub or smear the head or body with oil. And the Hebrew word for anoint is um, uh, mashash. Mashash, again, I do not speak <laughs> Hebrew or Greek, but what does that sound like to you, right? 
um, like massage, right? And it is used over and over in the Old Testament to talk about anointing the temple and about anointing the priests. So in Greek, the word um, messias, this noun means the anointed one. And it is used in John 141 and John 425 when referring to Jesus, right? Um, the anointed one. So anointing was performed during a sacred time or to consecrate someone or something for a sacred use, for a sacred purpose. So priests, um, sacred vessels, kings, and prophets are examples of this. They would be anointed because they were consecrated um, for a specific purpose um, and use. Okay, when you consecrate something that is, you're, you're making it, it's like special, right? Okay, so anointing was done as part of also um, hospitality. So Jews would use oils to refresh their bodies, and then sometimes they were offered, um, they were offered this service to like guests who would come into their home. They would rub their feet, you know, and a lot of people, um, they would cleanse their feet because when they were out walking in the dirt in their sandals and stuff like that, their feet were really dirty. So they would come in and they would have to wash their feet and they would have servants usually to wash their feet. But sometimes they would service their guests and it was um, an act of hospitality. And, um, you know, and of course we know that um, Jesus wash the feet of the disciples. But um, anyway, the oil was used for medicinal purposes um, as well, essential oils were, and bodies of the dead were sometimes anointed. So biblical anointing typically, typically involves uh, four things. Um, the pouring of oil, it is like, and this, this comes from Psalm 133 too, where it says it is like precious oil poured on the head, running down the beard, running down an Aaron's beard, down the collar of his robe. So when um, we talk about biblical anointing, it's the pouring of the oil. It's also laying on of hands. Um, it's also for prayer, like I said. Um, in James 5, 14, it says, Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and to anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And also biblical anointing was um, like blessing when you would bless someone. So Young Living has a very special kit called the Oils of Ancient Scripture. Okay, and in this kit, um, it comes sacred frankincense or sacred um sandalwood, cassia, cedar wood, cypress, frankincense, hyssop, myr myrtle, annika, and the rose of Sharon or cistus. cistus. So out of the oils that I listed, um, maybe I should say them again because <laughs> there's a few. Um, it's sacred sandalwood, cassia, cedar wood, cypress, frankincense, hyssop, myrrh, myrtle, Annika and Rose of Sharon, or it's also called Cystus. Out of all the oils that I just mentioned, which oil or oils did you recognize from reading in the Bible? Like, do you, that you identified as maybe a biblical oil? And you can just leave a comment. I just would be very curious to know, like, which, which one you remember reading about in the Bible. So <clears throat> I want to go through each of these oils and talk about their biblical significance and how they can be relevant and beneficial to us today. Because it's really fun to talk about these oils in the Bible, but you're probably also wondering, well, like, you're, you're wondering, like, well, what, what good is it for me today? Like, why do I need these oils? Um, so I'm going to start with myrrh. Um, because myrrh is the most commonly referenced aromatic oil in the Bible. It is the first oil to be mentioned in Genesis 37, 25, and the last in Revelation 18, 13. Okay, so myrrh is the most commonly referenced aromatic oil in the Bible. It is the first oil to be mentioned in Genesis and the last in Revelation, which I think is really fascinating. In Genesis 37, we read about the story of Joseph and his brothers. And this is the very first direct mention of an essential oil in scripture. And it is when Joseph's brothers sold him to spice traders that were headed to Egypt. And these spice traders, camels, were loaded with spices. They were loaded with balm and myrrh. And myrrh was 
also one of the gifts the brothers would gift as a give as a gift to their brother Joseph decades later. Um, isn't that interesting? <laughs> kind of interesting to see that this oil kind of comes full circle in this story about Joseph. Go back, read about the story of Joseph and how he was sold into slavery by his brothers. They put him in a pit and then they were like, yeah, maybe we shouldn't do that. <laughs> maybe we'll sell, sell him. We'll get some stuff, you know, get some money for him. And um, yeah, so, and then they ended up decades later um, bringing him their own brother, which they didn't know was his brother, but it's, it's an amazing, amazing story. Go read that if you've never read that. Um, but that's where myrrh is, is discussed. So myrrh was a commonly used oil in biblical times, and it is all over scripture. I mean, we can see it in Matthew 2 at the birth of Christ and in Mark 15 at the cross. Um, it's an ingredient in the holy anointing oil. It was part of the six-month beautification process of Esther to prepare her for marriage to the king. It is used. Um, it is used as a perfume, as incense, as ointment, a gift for Jesus. Like I said, a mixture with wine at the cross. Um, at the cross, and it was sometimes given to those being crucified. Um, it's part of the burial preparation for Christ's body, and possibly um, it was used in spices to be eaten. So why and how do we use myrrh? Um, myrrh is very purifying. It is revitalizing, and it's uplifting. It's very high in a chemical um, compound called sesquiterpenes. Now, I'm going to get all nerdy on you, okay, because I think that this is really important to talk about. So sesquiterpenes is a chemical compound, okay, and this compound has profound effects on the hypothalamus, the pituitary, and the amygdala, which is the seat of your emotions. It's the motherboard of all of your emotions and memory. So this oil is known to help with emotional stability, with focus, and with concentration. Does anybody need any emotional stability or focus or concentration? <laughs> but the really cool part about this is it promotes spiritual awareness. It is a very, very thick or viscous oil. It's very thick. It's kind of like honey. Um, and it ends up getting like thicker, I feel like, over time. It's very hard. Like once, I feel like once you open it up, it's like, then it becomes harder and harder to get out of the bottle. You're like waiting and waiting <laughs> for one drop to come out. So what you'll want to do when you get this oil, this amazing oil, myrrh, is you'll want to put some carrier oil, like olive oil or something like that, on the inside of the cap, okay? So on the inside of the cap, you're going to smear some olive oil in there, and then that way it will slide on and slide off easily. Otherwise, over time, eventually, the more you, you know, you're using it, you're going to get some, a little bit of myrrh um, in the grooves here, and then it becomes very difficult. It's like sticks. So it's, it becomes very difficult to get off. Uh, so I usually, usually have to take my myrrh bottle over to my hubby, and he has to pry it off. So just when you get it, put some olive oil on the inside. So in ancient times, it was used as a base for more volatile oils. So when we think of volatile oils, volatile means that it evaporates and moves very, very quickly into the air. That's why when we open up a bottle of essential oil, we almost immediately can start to smell the aroma because those essential oil molecules are just like, oh, they're firing all over the place. So that, that means they're volatile. So the myrrh actually kind of helps to keep the oils from evaporating and it kind of prolongs the life in the perfumes and the in, in ointments that were um, that they created uh, back in Bible times and in now and now per, um, myrrh is used a lot in perfume. So when we look at historical records, we find that myrrh was recommended to be used for perfume and in perfume, uh, for medicine, for oral health, for healing salves, for abrasions and other skin ailments, for bruises and sprains and aches. And the gum, because it's a resin, myrrh is a resin, so they would take the, um, the, the resin, the gum, gummy resin, 
and they would chew on it. And this would help with indigestion and with ulcers and colds and coughs and asthma and lung congestion and arthritis pain. It was also uh, used for circulatory problems and uterine health and beauty treatments and skin conditions as a sun protection and insect repellent. So there were so many uses, and that's what I love about essential oils is that one bottle of oil can do so many things and can cover so many systems of the body and ailments, and I just love that about the oils. Um, God in his design and creating the oils with all of their chemical constituents, like that just, it blows my mind, and how they work so well in the human body, like God created that knowing that we would need them and use them for that purpose. So myrrh is a dominant oil in my DIY face serum. Like myrrh is always in my face serum. I figure if Esther used it for beautification, then it must be good. <laughs> she used it, so, and she was gorgeous. So anyway, um, the scent is characterized as being warm and earthy and woody and balsamic. Um, I personally don't really, I don't love the smell alone, but um, I find that it pairs very nicely with other oils like frankincense and lavender and patchouli and sandalwood and cinnamon bark, nutmeg, ginger, and clove. So, you know, if you don't like the smell of myrrh by itself and you want to say use it in your diffuser or use it in your skincare, you know, use it with other oils because it kind of helps to cover that, that smell up, um, which I know that there's people who love myrrh. So, if you love myrrh, I'd be curious. If you are an oiler, do you love the smell of myrrh? Um, maybe, maybe you do. So you can use myrrh topically for all things skin, all things skin, and use it aromatically during prayer um, when you want greater focus and concentration. And then also use it during Christmas, right? Put it in your diffuser during Christmas time because frankincense and myrrh, which we're going to talk about. Um, so cassia, so I'm going to talk about cassia. I know that, um, I can't remember, I can't remember now who it was that mentioned said, talk about, maybe it was Lori, I don't remember. Um, but you want to talk about cassia. So, um, other than it's mentioned in Ezekiel 27 as an item of trade, um, and another mention in Psalm 45, 8 as a perfume, cassia is only used in scripture in the holy anointing oil from Exodus 30. However, this anointing blend is referred throughout scripture. So cassia um, is in that holy anointing oil. So um, cassia typically refers to the bark from an evergreen tree originating in southern China. And it is a lot like cinnamon, but it is quite a bit hotter, quite a bit hotter than cinnamon. But it does kind of have that cinnamony. Um, uh, smell to it, but it is hot. So when I say hot, I mean that it's, um, when you apply it to the skin, it can be, it can feel hot. It's it, it, like, it will cause a skin sensitivity. So you absolutely 100%, just as if you were going to be using uh, cinnamon, cinnamon bark, you want to dilute it if you're going to use it topically. Um, I probably wouldn't use cassia topically. Um, I just would use it for aromatic purposes, um, just to avoid any, especially if you are, if you do have very sensitive skin. So historically, cassia has been called um, an oil of gladness for its emotional uplifting effects. It does. It just smells, it smells good. It's like, like I said, it's, it's very much resembles cinnamon. Um, it was used to support the immune system and to help the digestive system, and um, it, it helped the digestive system. It helps the digestive system function smoothly, right? Um, it may even help with improving blood circulation. All right, so anica. Anica is another oil, and it is mentioned in the holy incense of in Exodus 30, and it is a gum, a gum resin, another gum resin used by ancient Egyptians in the art of perfumery and incense. And I, I, I know why, because it's like, it's sweet. To me, it, it smells very sweet. Um, it was also used for dental. Historically, it was used for dental health and care. And so the resin uh, was used, the resin of the Annika um, was used as um, a dental restorative material. 
and it was a primary ingredient in tinctures for small injuries. Um, it was also used as a disinfectant or a local anesthetic, and it was used to speed healing of wounds. So the fragrance of Ad Annika would have been perfumed, um, would have perfumed the sanctuary, right, as part of the holy incense. And it, it, it I really do like Annika. It's, it's very sweet to me. It smells, smells really good. Um, in the Song of Psalms, we read about the Rose of Sharon or Cistus, uh, Cistus oil. And it was used as a way um, uh, that Solomon's lover describes herself, right? This beautiful rose has a honey-like scent, but it is different from that thorny rose. Um, let me get this here. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Um, okay. So it's not like the rose that, you know, you think of, the thorny rose. Um, historically, uh, this resin from cystus was used as an ingredient for incense um, and used medicinally to treat coughs and colds and menstrual problems and rheumatism. So talk about versatility, right? Like that's just the, the gamut. <laughs> you go from colds to rheumatism to arthritis, you know, to uh, menstrual problems. But, um, but anyway, yeah, so the Rose of Sharon or cystus. You know, it's interesting because um, when I smell this, now we all have different responses to, you know, the oils, right? And so whenever I smell this one, this, this may sound really, really strange, but I, I think of tobacco. So I think of when my grandpa used to smoke a pipe, right? He had a pipe and he would smoke tobacco. And that's what this reminds me of. If that's weird. I don't know why, but that's what that, because that's, you know, we talk about the effects essential oils have on the brain and when we inhale the aroma and how those essential oil molecules travel to the limbic system of the brain, which is the seat of our emotions and memory, like we are brought back to a time and place when we smell certain things. Like when you smell cinnamon, when I ask that, what do you think of when you smell cinnamon? And most people say, I smell, I think of Christmas or I think of my grandma's apple pie or whatever. Like you're, you're transported to that time and place. And so when I smell cystus or Rose of Sharon, I think about my grandfather smoking a pipe, tobacco pipe. So it, but in a good way, like it smells good to me. It's not like a bad, a bad thing. I don't know. <laughs> so, um, Anyway, so the um, the cystus uh, the cystus was like I said it was used in uh, an incense and it was used medicinally, but the resin was commonly found along the shrubs where goats wandered, um, and the shepherds would commonly use it on the skin of their goats to promote healing when they were injured. So when you use it aromatically, it can help to quiet the nerves, it can elevate emotions, and it can actually assist in sleeping. And it blends really, really well with bergamot and clary sage and cypress and juniper and lavender and patchouli, pine, sandalwood, and vetiver. Um, it blends very well with those. So, all right, cedar wood. Now, cedar wood is mentioned throughout scripture, um, often as a part of the materials used for building, and it is believed to be the very first essential oil ever distilled. Now, Egyptians and Sumerians used cedar wood in their embalming processes over 5,000 years ago, and they also used the oil for medicinal purposes and the timber to build dwellings and temples and instruments and coffins and boats, because the cedar trees from which we get our oil today, though, is is not the same, okay? It's different from the cedars of Lebanon from around the time of Christ because the ancient species of cedar wood are endangered and protected. So we, we will not have the same exact oil um, from the cedar, the cedar wood. But to understand the deeper significance of cedar wood in scripture, I just want to tell you tell you first why cedar wood is so amazing and then I think you'll have a deeper understanding and appreciation for its use in the Bible. So this oil contains 98% sesquiterpenes. So I mentioned sesquiterpenes. Whenever, if you hear sesquiterpenes, not that you're going to hear this, <laughs> You know, the next time you hear sesquiterpenes mentioned in, you know, your daily life, um, think of brain. Think of your 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 mind, okay? Because that's what essential oils high in sesquiterpenes, 
um, can help you think clearly. It increases our ability to think clearly, to focus, to concentrate, because sesquiterpenes can cross the blood-brain barrier and it helps to oxygenate the brain. And that's what our brain needs to function properly is oxygen. Our whole body needs oxygen. But when we oxygenate the brain, we allow it to work better. And, and this is simply just from inhaling the aroma. So this oil also enhances melatonin stimulation in the brain, which promotes good sleep. It can clear the mental clutter also promoting a good night's sleep, right? Because sometimes we can't go to sleep because we're thinking about stuff that's going on or we're bothered or stressed by something or we might make up in the middle of the night because we're, our mind is just going crazy. Use cedar wood because cedar wood has an ability just to help to clear that mental clutter to help you to get a good night's sleep. So anytime you need filtering out of the noise and focusing on a task, use cedar wood and what's really cool about cedar wood is that it is a very inexpensive oil a 15 milliliter bottle like this size is only like ten dollars so and there's like 250 drops in a in a 15 milliliter bottle of oil so so good um there is also a connection to cedar wood and the emotional balance uh with conceit and pride this is really interesting. So this topic leads me to a man in the Bible who is pretty stinking smart and wise, but his downfall ended up being conceit and pride and a falling away um, from God. And um, I don't know if anybody, well, I don't have time because I'm, I'm already like got so much to talk about. But um, anyway, so um, the man I'm talking about is Solomon. So King Solomon became king following his father, David, in 971 BC. And in 1 Kings 3.9, we read about Solomon's request to God. And he said, give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? And the Lord was pleased with Solomon's humility and requesting wisdom the Lord offers him three things, a wise and discerning heart, wealth and honor, and a long life. And God gave Solomon very specific instructions on building the temple. And in 1 Kings 6, it says that Solomon lined the temple's interior walls with cedar boards, paneling them from the floor of the temple to the ceiling and covered the floor of the temple with planks of juniper. So if any of you have cedar closets, you know that cedar is very sturdy. It can keep the bugs away and it's very highly aromatic, right? So could this, just a thought, but could this highly aromatic oil, high in brain supporting compounds have been a factor when Solomon visited the temple? So we know that later in King Solomon's reign, we, we see him chase after other gods, and he returns back to his idolatrous beliefs. His um, fame and his fortune could have contributed to his pride and his conceit, which we talked about. Um, he would no longer visit the temple as he once did, the, the temple that was lined with these cedar boards, high in sesquiterpenes, allowing the mind to be very focused and wise, right? And I'm not saying that that is what God gave him wisdom. God allowed him that. But I just think it's really interesting. And I, I wonder, like, was a strategic placement from the Lord in building the temple with a wood known to increase the brain capacity as well as help root out conceit and pride? I just think it's a very interesting thought. So Cypress, so Cypress is another oil, and Cypress is an oil that I'm giving away um, tonight. So this is another oil found in scripture, um, and it's used as a building material for large temples and structures. And in the passage, uh, we read about, in the passage that we read about, you know, building the temple, um, the NIV translation mentions using juniper for the floors. But most other translation, uh, translations use the word cypress. And it was common for building ships and building houses. But in biblical times, cypress trees were planted in Mediterranean cemeteries, symbolizing that life after death had begun. So emotionally, 
Emotionally speaking, Cyprus supports feelings of security and stability, which is perfect for the floors of the temple, right? And because we know that God is very purposeful in everything he does. Like, think about how he instructed Noah and, and how he built the ark. I mean, he gave him very, very specific dimensions, instructions, told him what, what, um, what to use to build it. I mean, whenever God tells you to do something and he's very specific, it, there's, there's purpose, there's meaning, there's a reason behind it. Nothing is by chance or by accident. So there's a reason for God's instructions and commands. <laughs> so historically, Cyprus was known for being supportive of the immune and cardiovascular systems as well as for arthritis, laryngitis, scar tissue, and cramps. And so there are records dating back to 1800 BC mentioning Cyprus oil. All right, so then we we're going to move on to myrtle. So this oil has a very bright, refreshing scent. So it's kind of like eucalyptus or peppermint, and it just has a way of opening up the lungs, allowing for easy breathing. Historically, it was primarily used in religious ceremonies for purification rituals. So myrtle is part of the um, Sokut, so I believe that's how you say that, um, it, um, the Feast of Tabernacles. And so the Feast of Tabernacles uh, celebrates the end of the Exodus, so the 40 years of wandering the Israelites experience between Egypt and the promised land. So that's that, um, that's, um, the Feast of Tabernacles celebrates that. And so the plant has a very pleasant smell. I like the smell of, of uh, myrtle, um, but it has a very bitter, unpleasant taste, was, which this was supposed to represent the good deeds, but a lack of knowledge. So again, everything being very symbolic in I mean, there's such rich meaning in all of these uh, ceremonies and rituals and practices. So, the second place that Myrtle shows up is in the book, um, in the or in the Bible, is in the book of Esther. And in Hebrew, the word Myrtle is um, the feminine form of the word Hadas. And Hadasa, um, Hadasa is Esther's Jewish name. So that's kind of cool. And myrtle is incredibly supportive um, also to the endocrine system, specifically the thyroid. And it's very soothing, like I said, to the respiratory system. All right, so let's move on to frankincense, right? Because this is the star. Frankincense and myrrh is like the star of the Bible. So Frank and Frank, I call it, okay, <laughs> Frank, you know, Frank and myrrh. So frankincense and myrrh are the two most commonly mentioned oils in the, in, in the Bible simply because they were two of the most commonly used oils uh, during that time period. And this is, to say it's an incredible oil, an amazing oil, is an understatement. Um, it's just, yeah, frankincense oil comes from, uh, the, we get the oil from tapping the Boswelli tree to get the resins that oozes out of the tree. Okay, so frankincense, so we talked about sesquiterpenes. Um, frankincense is high in monoterpenes, another chemical compound. And what monoterpenes do is they help the body eliminate toxins in the body, from the body. And it is commonly used in meditation and also spiritual practices. And it is a tremendous support to the skin and it helps also with emotional support. So if you're experiencing the blues or if you're just having an off day, frankincense. And frankincense is a lot like lavender in that it is so versatile and can be used for just about everything. And my hubby, my husband, uses frankincense for focus and I use it, I mean I do like it for focus too and concentration, but I also really like to use it for um, to support cellular health. So you can safely ingest frankincense vitality, um, and you can put it in a vegetable capsule. You can put it in your Ningxia Red. Um, Young Living has a, a wolfberry puree juice, highly antioxidant juice. Um, it's incredible for all sorts of things, but cellular support, immune system support, uh, all sorts of great things, antioxidant support, but you can add your frankincense, and that's what I do is I add my frankincense to, um, to my Ningxia Red or a vegetable capsule, so you can take it that way. 
But frankincense, this is the really cool part, is frankincense was also used to anoint newborn sons of kings and priests. Significant? <laughs> um, it was and is an oil of great value. If you, I'm just going to say this on the side, if you find frankincense oil cheap, you need to run and you need to just stay away from it because to acquire true, legit, pure, unadulterated frankincense, like it's going to be pricey because it takes, uh, it takes a bit to get it, okay? And I'm going to talk about that. But in scripture, we read about frankincense in Matthew 2 as it was one of the gifts given to Mary and Joseph at the birth of Jesus, right? They, um, they, uh, they were given by the wise men uh, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and they were given to the Christ child. And these were gifts for health, and they were gifts for royalty. There was a lot of symbolic meaning. They were only given to... Um, they were only given to kings and priests and royalty. So what does that say? That these three wise men, they knew, they knew who Jesus was. They knew he was the Messiah. And Mary and Joseph would have known what to do with these valuable gifts. You know, you know, they were um, not only symbolic, but they were very supportive. So they would have supported um, healing of skin. They would have supported um help with emotions. Um, and scholars think that these three gifts were chosen for their spiritual symbolism about Jesus himself, like gold, gold representing his kingship, frankincense, a symbol of a priestly role, and myrrh, a prefiguring of his death and embalming, like that foreshadowing. Isn't that amazing? Because Frank or myrrh was used a lot in embalming and for in at the end of life. So, but by this point in the New Testament, Frank, uh, frankincense has been mentioned several dozen times directly or indirectly as a member of another combination, such as the holy incense of Exodus 30. And in Numbers uh, 16, we read of a plague that the, um, the Lord sends to destroy the Israelites, but Aaron fills his censer with the holy incense, and he steps between the living and those already dead from the plague, and he raises the burning censer and makes atonement for them. But it also, think about the... When, you, when, we, when we know and understand the chemical properties, the chemical com compounds that are in that and what those chemical compounds can do to disease and viruses and bacteria and molds, it's just like, wow, that is so cool. So frankincense and myrrh were both gathered as resin from trees. The method for retrieving the resin is quite fascinating, and this is why, this is absolutely why um, you're not going to find good quality, real, true frankincense cheap. It's just, it's not because the method for retrieving the oil, the resin is quite extensive. So frankincense is harvested by wounding the tree in a process called tapping. So if you know anything about maple syrup, right? You tap a tree, you get the maple syrup. Kind of like the same thing, except this sap is so thick and it's gummy and it's it's a resin right and so this sap much like a tree's blood runs to the surface to heal to begin healing that wound so the resin hardens on the surface of the tree this is the cool thing this is the biblical symbolism that i think is amazing so only after the tree is wounded and bleeding does it create the life-giving resin. And this is the very picture of Christ that bled and died on a tree, right? So Christ's blood, let me just, I'm just going to back up for a second before I get to that. But just so you, like if you can get a visual of someone um, slicing a tree, okay, cutting a tree, and then this thick uh, resin, this, it's, it starts oozing out to start to heal that, that, um, that cut. And that's what is collected. That resin is collected and that is distilled. And that's how we get frankincense and myrrh essential oil. So Christ's blood 
is covering is a covering for our sins and transgressions. In Romans 3, 23 through 25, it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. And that is that is the 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 promise and the hope and the plan of salvation that we have. Um, so that's just really, really cool. But I just think that that's really neat how we get frankincense and myrrh um, is much like, kind of like, it's a picture, right? It's a picture of Christ. So hyssop. This is my most favorite biblical oil in terms of, symbol, uh, in, of symbolism and how it is referenced in scripture. So hyssop is a brightly colored shrub that resembles lavender in some ways. So both hyssop and lavender are from the mint family of flowering plants. Historically, hyssop um, was used to make a strong tea to help with the nose, throat, and lung afflictions. And it would also be applied to bruises. And its scent is... Um, it's fresh, it's earthy, it's woody, it's fruity, and it's slightly sweet. So it is. <laughs> I confirm. <laughs> um, no, it is good. It's good. I think I would diffuse this one. It's very good. Um, the more I smell it, the more I like it. Um, but anyway, in the Bible, the primary use of hyssop was for a ritual of purging, cleansing, and ceremonial offerings. I'm telling you, this is, this is the story. Okay, hyssop is what made me cry when I, when I was teaching this and reading about this and studying this. It was like, okay, so I'm not going to cry. Um, but in Leviticus 13, we find instructions for a ritual cleansing of lepers, lepers involving cedar wood and hyssop. But in the next chapter, we read about hyssop used in more complicated recipes for skin diseases and mold um, remediation. But this is, this is the kicker for me. In Exodus 5, Moses begins negotiating with Pharaoh to let my people go, right? Um, I can't help but think of Charleston. Is it Charleston? <laughs> the Moses movie, the Ten Commandments. Let my people go. Okay, so just think about that. Pharaoh refuses, uh, Pharaoh refuses um, to let the people go. Um, and the Egyptians, <laughs> now I'm going to laugh instead of cry. <laughs> this is hilarious. Okay, so um, Pharaoh refuses and the Egyptians are subjected to 10 plagues sent by God against the people. That is not funny. But the 10th the plague is on the firstborn. If you don't know this story, go to Exodus 5 and read this story. It's incredible. Um, so to protect themselves, the Lord told Moses and Aaron that the people should take a perfect lamb and slaughter it. And in Exodus 12, the Israelites are instructed to paint their doorposts with the blood from this lamb using hyssop branches. <clears throat> So they are to dip the hyssop branch into the blood and put some of the blood on the top of both the sides of, um, at the top and both sides, top, both sides of the door frame. So every, four, uh, every firstborn son in Egypt would die, Egyptians and Israelites, but those in their homes under the blood of the lamb would be spared. And that would be, and they would be passed over by the angel of death. That's where we get the Passover. That's Passover. So in striking the door in this pattern with the hyssop and the blood, they made a cross pattern on the door with the red blood, and the hyssop leaves would be bruised as they struck the doors, releasing the scent of the oil. So the Israelites would have smelled the blood intermingled with the crisp scent of hyssop as they protected their homes. Now, the Old Testament ritual for Passover, this is what blows me away. This is my favorite part of this whole class. <laughs> this is my favorite part. The Old Testament ritual of Passover foreshadows Christ's crucifixion, where we read about hyssop again. Now, I want to, so 
my reference, part of my reference for all that I'm teaching tonight comes from, there's a, I have a couple books, um, but this is one of them. It's called Oils and Scripture by Aaron Rodgers. It is incredible. It's a very easy way to understand oils in the Bible. There are other more uh, deep, um, pretty meaty uh, books on the, the essential oils in the Bible and, and stuff and their meaning and significance and their uses. And I mean, it gets into it way, way, way more than this, but obviously we don't have all night. I'm already over an hour, which I did not want to be. Um, but I just wanted to read this to you because I just am blown away by this, okay, that, that foreshadowing. When we look at the Passover and the use of hyssop, and then we, we see it again. Um, so I want to read this to you, and it's from this book. So it says, when Christ, or while Christ's death uh, wouldn't be the end of his story here on earth, it was necessary for the perfect lamb to die in order for his blood to cover our sins. Jesus came to earth knowing he would die in one of the most gruesome and torturous forms of executions. Uh, execution. It was customary to offer those being crucified a cheap Roman wine mixed with myrrh as a painkiller to help dull the senses and deal with the horrors of their death. Jesus refused it when first offered at the start, but just before his death, he accepted one final drink. Um, and it, it quotes the, the, the scripture in here, John 19, 28 through 30. It says later, knowing that everything had now been finished, and so that scripture would be fulfilled. Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there. So they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. So if you read the passage on crucifixion in full, in full and in several uh, gospels, you'll see that Jesus was offered two kinds of wine. The first wine was mixed with gall, which Christ refused once he, once he tasted it. The one he later accepted was wine mixed with myrrh. The wine was lifted up on a stalk of hyssop. It is believed that the use of hyssop at crucifixions may have helped in some small way to ease the suffering of those being crucified as it is extremely soothing to the lungs when inhaled. Victims of crucifixion die from suffocation due to the weight of their own bodies pulling down on them and their lungs filling with fluid. And hyssop is supportive to the respiratory system and helps break up nasal fluid. As the branch was lifted to his face, I have no doubt the aroma of hyssop mixed with blood was strikingly similar to the aroma that Israelites smelled as they prepared for the Passover. So when you use um, hyssop, in, uh, hyssop oil in your home, I encourage you to remember you are inhaling the very same aroma our Savior experienced as he gave his life as a ransom for our sins. Oh my gosh. I don't know about you, but that just like... That blows me away. <laughs> I don't know. That just, that makes me tear up. So anyway, hyssop, um, hyssop the, the meaning behind hyssop is, is incredible. But so hyssop is helpful to the cardiovascular system, as I mentioned, the nervous system and the respiratory systems. Apply this oil to the bottoms of the feet and diffuse this oil. Avoid this oil, though, if you are pregnant or if you have high blood pressure or you if you have epilepsy. Okay, that's the disclaimer for that. The last oil we're going to learn about is sacred uh, sacred sandalwood, and, and it's also referred to as aloes. And this oil has a soft wood, woody, sweet, earthy, and balsamic fragrance. Um, where is it? Aloes. Okay, and um, it is the most valuable sandalwood. Mm, sandalwood is the most valuable tree in the world. It's considered a parasitic tree, actually, which taps the roots of other species for water and inorganic nutrients. And historically, sandalwood was used for meditation and for embalming. And it was common for pharaohs to be buried with alabaster jars of perfumes, including sandalwood. So sandalwood is another oil really, really high in sesquiterpenes brain, think about brain, uh, making it a great oil for oxygenating the brain, helping with clear thinking and focus. It also encourages really great sleep. But my favorite use is in my skincare. I also use this in my DIY 
skincare uh, uh, face serum. And it's a it's just such a great oil for the skin. But it also promotes emotional balance and helps calm and harmonize strong emotions. Anybody have strong emotions? <laughs> um, so you can use this oil topically or in your diffuser and it goes really really great with cypress and frankincense and lemon myrrh ylang ylang patchouli and spruce so that I mean I honestly I could I could go a lot deeper and I could go to tell you more and more and more about it but we don't have all night and um, yeah so that's what I have on the essential oils of the Bible. And I talked specifically about these oils in this kit. Um, it's one of Young Living's uh, great kits. And you, if you are a Young Living member, you can get this kit and um, experience all the oils and just think about the ways that um, they were used in Bible times and the meaning and the significance, but also know that there is great um, health benefit. There is emotional benefit um, to these oils. And again, I just want to reiterate that it's not about how amazing the oils are, even though they are incredible, but we want to um, to really think about um, how amazing our God is for creating these and for even mentioning like it essential oils didn't have to be mentioned in the Bible but they have purpose and significance and meaning and they were used um, you know they were used by God he created plants and he gave us these amazing gifts so we look to him and thank him and, and thank our giver. Um, we don't praise and worship the gift. We worship the giver. So I just hope that this um, helps you appreciate, maybe appreciate the oils a little bit more and know that there's it's, it's so much more, so much more than just, oh, they just make my house smell good. <laughs> um, but anyway, so does anybody have any questions before I get off? Wow. Yeah, I am going to have to go back and I'm going to have to um, look to see who has answered and because otherwise I'm going to have to, I'll be here all night trying to figure out who answered what. But maybe I should um, ask those questions again. If, um, the ones that I had mentioned to receive the gifts. So my oily gifts. So the three questions I had at the very beginning were name one oil listed in the holy anointing oil. My second question was what is the first oil to be mentioned in Genesis and the last in Revelation? And which oil is referred to as the oil of gladness? So, so those were the three questions that I asked at the beginning of this class. And if you know the answers to those, put them in the comments and then I will enter you in a drawing and I'm going to send somebody, I've got three gifts. I'm going to send somebody a bottle of Cypress. I'm going to send, um, some two people a bottle of holy anointing oil roll on so anybody want any of those <laughs> so anyway well if you have any questions please uh reach out to me send me a message let me know please share this with your friends and family if you think that they would be interested in learning more about um the ancient oils of scripture and and all about this it's pretty pretty cool I think especially around Christmas time when our focus our focus should always be on our Savior <laughs> always but um, but I think it's just kind of cool to um, yeah to talk about it right now so I want to thank you so much for staying with me this entire time because I went over an hour and like I said I did not want to go I wanted to be under an hour but <laughs> And I didn't even like there. I didn't even scratch the surface. Really, there's so much more. Oh my goodness! And I really highly recommend you get this book, Oils Plus Scripture by Aaron Rodgers. Uh, if you want a, a more simplistic, um, under like easily understandable um, way to learn, there are like I said, there's other books out there that are tremendous, but they're meaty. 
great resources, but yeah. So, so please share with your friends. Please share this with your friends if you think they would um, benefit from this. So thank you all so much for joining me tonight. I really appreciate your time and I hope it was helpful. So keep um, answering the questions and, um, and uh, yeah, and I will, I will announce, I will announce the winners in this, um, in this thread. Okay. All right, everybody. Thank you so, so much. I hope it was, I hope you enjoyed it. All right. And, oh, I probably should mention, like, if you don't, <laughs> if you don't have these oils and you want them and you're not a Young Living member, please reach out to me. I would be very happy to help you. Um, I would be very ha happy to help you get your own oils. Okay. All right. Have a good night, everybody. God bless.